So thank you, uh, thank you very much for the invitation for, for organising this great event. Um, let me mention, because I may well forget during the talk, to highlight uh, why this is something to talk about at this event. So um, <laughs> the main thing uh, that I'm going to be looking at is um, some different non-standard realist ways of thinking about time. So this is um, Kit Fine's um, non-standard realism and the, the views he's inspired. And the view I like um, lacks coherence between either the facts that hold as of different times or the fragments. So the fragments are already um, sets of tensed facts that are um, collectively coherent amongst themselves but incoherent globally and uh, there's going to be a lack of harmony between the fragments in the view I like. So I mention that now in case I forget to sort of stress that later on. Um, and I'm coming back to this because the view I like... Um, so there's a recent book by um, Samueli Iacuento and um, Giolini uh, um, Tarengo, uh, um, advocating a view which sort of touches on lots of the things that my view covered, but they do things in a very different way, and I'm going to try and convince you that you should like my view more. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start by saying something about branching time and the thin red line, and then I'm going to give you three versions of a red line which is invisible, unlike the red line that uh, Belknap and others have criticised, and then I'm going to consider um, how the positions can be modified and generalised to take account of special relativity and even general relativity. So, here are the guys, uh, yeah, Quinto and Tarengo, and the invisible in the invisible thin red line is their um, coinage, I think. Um, and as I say, the paper that, where I, I, I say something which I now want to call an invisible thin red line view, although it doesn't count uh, in, in their terms. So, branching time. Um, branching time models are used to model um, the open future when we think there's genuine openness in what might happen. So imagine we're at T0, and notice that in this diagram we've got two things that you want to keep distinguished, and this is going to become important when we um, see um, the uh, INT view. So there are times, right, these are the things that are corresponding to horizontal slices through the diagram, and there are also these nodes, um, moments, and these moments M1 and M2 are effectively different ways, they, they, they mark different ways things might go at time T1. So M1 and M2 are not themselves times. So although um, this gets called a branching time diagram, don't think that this means the M's as they're labelled in this diagram in times. The times are uh, the things that correspond to a horizontal dimension here. And so we're thinking, I'm going to do some experiments, the outcome might be up or down, but it's genuinely open what's going to happen. So a nice way to represent that, it seems, is as of T0, I consider the possibilities open for the future. It could be up, it could be down, and that leads you to this, this branching diagram. Now, think of this like a Kripke model for modal truth, and I think the nice way of thinking about um, how you might represent modal truth with the Kripke model also involves your having a preferred node, the actual world. And of course, the standard semantics for, um, standard Kripke semantics for a modal language don't define truth, they define truth relative to a world. Um, here, the standard semantics for something like this is going to give you truth relative to both a uh, moment and a history. Um, so um, H1, M1 pairs. Um, but we want to know what's true. We want to know what the right analogue for the um, actual world is for a, a, a diagram like this. And there are two choices. 
right? You might think, well, um, how things are, full stop, corresponds to how things are at time t1, and how things are at time t1, say, is going to be either as they are at m1 or m2. So we put in a dot that corresponds to how things are actually right now. Um, but you might also put in uh, the red line. Now, why might you do that? Um, so, if we just put in the dot, um, well, let's, let's consider what you might do with the red line. Okay. So, we're considering how things are at this node, M1. And given the red line, which is meant to represent the represent how things have been and also how things will turn out, the actual course of history, it's true that the outcome at T2 uh, will be down. That's what the red line is doing for you. It's not true that it will be up, right? So the red line does not pass through uh, the topmost node at T2. So the outcome will be down, it won't be up. But the whole point of the branching was to represent that although, well, that it might be up. It's meant to be genuinely open. So it looks as if by drawing in this red line, you're obliterating the, the openness. It's not clear what sense you can make of the claim that it might be up. So I just find this combination hard to make sense of. The outcome will be down, it won't be up, but it might be up, right? Any branching diagram like this with a red line understood in this way seems to me just to reduce to a picture like this, where we've got the actual history, um, and there's no branching. There are other ways the world could have been, and you might be able to make sense of certain Meitnikutians using those other possibilities, but they're not, in the same way that these were, part of the world. Genuine, open possibilities for the future as of now. Of course, when I say they're part of the world, uh, in the diagram we have here, Right? They're not parts of the world in the B theory sense. They're not distant future mode, future, they're not distant parts of a B theoretic universe to the future. Right? These diagrams are just a way of reading off the tensed facts. But the point is, if you put in a red line, you seem to break the symmetry and lose the idea that it's genuinely open. Uh, it really might be up. Right? You're losing that when you put in the red line. But having said all that, um, I like red lines. So, um, we're going to respect symmetry. And if you um, do your semantics in using the standard Occamist semantics and supervaluating the way Thomason suggested, you end up being able to say things like this. It's not the case that it definitely will be up. So, we're, we're all evaluating um, at this point, which represents the present time. It's not the case that it definitely will be up. It's not the case that it definitely will be down. It might be up. Either it will be up or down, right? So we seem to be able to say that it will turn out one way or the other. Um, in fact, more than that, either it will be up or it will be down. Um, so um, I think one thing to, to stress about some of these locutions, I'm not sure whether this is really going to fly. Um, in the context of... Um, worries about whether you can um, capture passage purely tense theoretically in the way Fabrice has said you can, in the way that Daniel has said you can against the kind of finey and frozen present worry. It seems to me that um, you really are not understanding the tensed operators in the intended way if you think somehow the present could be frozen. You can't really think it will be the case that such and such is the case, even though it isn't now, and think time doesn't pass. And I want to say some similar things about these mics and this kind of disjunction, right? Um, it, if you're understanding in the them in the right way, even though it's genuinely open, things are going to turn out one way or the other. Um, so that's what I want to be able to say. But anyway, all of this... Um, is standard tense realism, it privileges the present, um, and that's a problem when you want to worry about relativity. I should also say I'm a B theorist, so this is just my, <laughs> my being as sympathetic to the enemy as I can be.
Okay, so some invisible thin red lines. Um, so um, in this picture, we, we have, it's not true, sorry, um, yes, it's not true that it will be up and it's not true that it will be down. It will be up, lacks the truth value. It will be up, it will not be up. Both of those come out as neither true nor false on the Thomson way of doing things. And uh, this is a view, so we give up bivalence, and Barnes and Cameron have argued, no, there's a way of having genuine metaphysical indeterminacy, uh, even though they have bivalence, even though they have these will um, truths. So, um, Here's a long quote. Um, they say there is a set, so here's how they're thinking of metaphysical indeterminacy. There is a set of complete histories for W, the world, representing how W could be atemporally. That corresponds to all of these different histories in our diagram. Given what has happened up to T, these atemporal histories all agree what has happened up to T. They disagree on what happens after T. So they really are, although they don't like um, they have you know, a diatribe against branching time, but there's a way of using branching time diagrams to capture exactly the kind of things they want to say. Although, um, it's true that these don't naturally encode one possibility that Fabrice also likes, namely the doomsday possibility, that this might be the last time. Right. Um, so, I just flag that. I think you can deal with it, it would be messy, but anyway. Um, uh, they disagree on what happens after T, these different histories. It is indeterminate. So here's how they have metaphysical indeterminacy. They want to say, in this indeterminacy, which of these histories is the complete atemporal description of, the, of W's history? Because it is indeterminate what will happen in W. Um, but determinately, one and only one of these complete atemporal histories uh, atemporal descriptions. Only one of them is the complete atemporal description of W. So going back to this picture, on the Barnes and Cameron view, they want to say that as of now, it's indeterminate, it's not settled which of these histories will be the actual history. And yet they also want to say as of this time uh, that, it, that, that it will be that D is true. Um, they have bivalence. Now I I'm not sure I have completely parsed this view for myself, but uh, I flag it just because this is a fallback way of understanding the red line. So you have some genuine indeterminacy um, that the red line isn't determining, namely, as of this time, it's not settled which of these histories is going to be the at true atemporal description of the world. And yet, it's true, not determinately true, that the um, outcome will be D. That's what they want to say. Okay, so that's their thin red line. Um, here are the non-standard realist ones. So um, I think a lot of you are going to be completely familiar with this already. This is Kip Fine's version of McTaggart's paradox. He argued that you can't have all four of these things, namely that tense is irreducible and fundamental, that Tense facts constitute reality absolutely, that reality is coherent, and neutrality, no time, uh, no temporal perspective is privileged. So the standard presentist gives up this, right, one time, the dot in our diagram corresponds to the facts, full stop. Um, the B-theorist gives up this, and the non-standard realists give up one or other of these. And I've been generally not too concerned at saying which. Um, but um, Iaquinto and Tarengo uh, want to go for a view where you give up coherence, a fragmentalist view. So um, here's my view. Right. So we've got our familiar diagram, but no dot. Right. And um, here's what the red line does. So the idea is that we now just have truths as of T0, truths as of T1, truths as of T2, but there's no truth full stop. And the red line is telling you how to read off the diagram what's true as of T1. It's what's true at the node that the red line passes through. But if you want to know what tense truths are true at that node, 
you ignore the red line because that's not what it's in the diagram to represent. So there's no red line when you're asking what are the tense truths true as of M1, but if you're asking what's true as of T1, then you look at the red line and see which node is coloured red. That's the picture. Um, and that's it. Right, really super simple. Um, and uh, of course, um, here's the incoherence I, I flagged. Uh, um, right, we're giving up this kind of harmony between the fragments or the the um, the truths at times. So. I think you can say exactly the same thing, by the way. There's an easy fragmentist version of this. I take this model, I just uh, come up with all of these uh, tense truths that are true at these nodes and only these nodes. They're my fragments. There's my fragment in this picture of reality. Um, but we give up this, right? So you might think that even though what's true at t and what's true at tm plus 1 are incoherent with each other, right? Um, not P is true at T, say, but P is true at T plus N, right? So um, the fragments corresponding to T and Tn plus 1 are incoherent. Nonetheless, you might thought this is surely true, right? If it's true that it will be the case in N units of time that P at T, uh, then we also want that at Tn plus 1, P is true. Uh, and I'm giving that up because what we have here is might n units of time p, but it's neither true nor false that will n units of time p. But I also have at tn plus 1 p. Right. So that's the package. So is that a cost? I mean, if you're already just saying these are fundamental facts constituting reality, that you still have a certain kind of harmony. You still have harmony between might and um, present tense truths or other fragments. Uh, but your Quinto and Tarango want to have more. So, um, yes, let's just flag that, of course, I can have a non standard realist version of Barnes and Cameron. Right? So now I have bivalence for all uh, truths, uh, but uh, I just have that um, it's not determined as of. Uh, this node, whether it's this set of histories or this set of histories that are the true atemporal descriptions of reality, whereas as of this node it is determined that it's not these, but it's still indeterminate whether it's this or this. But for all, you know, truths about what will happen at T2 and so on, we have bivalence. So, you know, there's an obvious non-standard version of the Barnes and Cameron picture. Okay, so what's your Quinto and Tarango's picture? So um, they, let's start at the bottom, right? They want to say they both have this um, connection between a tense truth at x and a present tense truth at x plus n. But they want to actually go further because they think their view not only accommodates robust passage using primitive tense, but also explains it. They think they, right, they, they, they don't just have an if and only if here, they have that the tense truth that holds at this fragment, uh, that, that this claim is true because, well, but it, that this is true because this is true. So just perhaps in terms of the diagram, uh, right. Oh. Let's, let's go to a linear diagram. Okay, So we've got uh, true at this, um, in this fragment that it will be the case that D. At the fragment at the top, we've got it's, uh, the outcome is D. And they want to say that this tense truth is true because of the present tense truth at the uh, fragment in the future. Of course, they don't have primitively fragments in the future. They've got a story about. Uh, what the pseudo-temporal relation between fragments is. Um, I'm not going to go into that. Um, so, um, 
a couple of other things to, to stress about their view. So the tense facts that are constituting reality for them are they've got a, an official language to describe the view which is actually very s briefly sketched, very, um, you know, it's just a kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very simple kind of model um, of the kind of thing that, that you could elaborate. But you've, your language has various atomic truths, um, tense operators, these uh, obtains in fragment FX operators, um, and the truths that constitute reality are the truths expressed by simple sentences. These are going to be the atoms, but also tense sentences that you get by applying a tensed operator to an atom, and I think also iterating. Um, it's not clear to me that they rule out sentences with iterated tenses as also being facts that constitute reality. But they don't want conjunctions, disjunctions, other complex sentences to express facts. Um, and facts of this kind, sorry, sentences, claims of this kind, also don't express facts. They say something about how the facts um, are, um, how they obtain, how they constitute reality, but they don't, these sentences don't themselves express facts. Okay. Um, anyway, the key thing is that they, they have this link between the tense truth and the present tense truth, which it looked like we had to give up if we had a branching view that respected the symmetry between branches. And yet, you know, the kind of big um, selling point of their view is meant to be that it accommodates a branching picture. So how does their view work? And this is kind of the heart of the, the talk in some ways, um, just telling you what they say about this. So we have instants, which are what I was calling times, and we've got what they're calling nodes, which are like my moments, and we've also got fragments, which are just these um, maximally, set, maximally set of reality constituting, maximally coherent sets of reality constituting facts. And they say the following about the fragments. Um, so, they're talking about this diagram I think we've got. So one of these, don't know which way it's going to go here, H1, the other H2, um, they're calling them pseudo-histories because they're sequences of fragments ordered by something which sort of mimics the, the temporal relation. Um, and they say clearly uh, that both the pseudo-histories H1 and H2 pass through the fragment F0. Of course, within F0, only the facts about one or other of these corresponding histories obtain. Right? So, whereas at my notes, I want to say it might be the case that something happens uh, corresponding to a fact here, and it might be the case that something happens corresponding to a fact here. I don't have it being such that it will be the case uh, that one or other of these. Sorry, I have it will. I have the. Uh, it will be one or it will be the other. I of course have will one or the other, but I don't have it will be say. Um, fact in F1. What they say is F0 determinately has one or other of these, right? So they have bivalence in that sense. And what they basically do is at a node you've got a bunch of fragments with all the full will facts and full bivalence with respect to them. Um, some aligning in the right way with that pseudo-history, some aligning in the right way with the other pseudo-history. So you've got a bunch of different fragments at this node. Uh, that's what this, this guy uh, is labelling. They agree in all their present tense facts. Uh, they agree in all their past tense facts. In fact, it's in terms of a certain kind of agreement of past tense facts that you're going to be able to identify this. And it's in terms of um, uh, inclusion of um, certain past tense facts that you're going to actually define the temporal order 
Um, but the key thing is you're going to have different fragments corresponding to the different histories, which together make up a node. So a node is just an equivalence class map of fragments matching with respect to the past, matching with respect to the present tense facts, but differing uh, with respect to the future tense facts. And the order they define is branching, but of course we've got both, well, okay, so, so let, let, let me just give you the quotes and then we'll, we'll look at a picture again. So at each node, remember these are collections of fragments um, differing each, differing with respect to the future. Um, at each node, time branches. Um, and no future tense fact obtaining at any of the fragments in the node are privileged in any metaphysical sense. Later on the same page, they go on to say, there is a definite answer to the question which fragments contain facts that constitute reality, simply because there is no privileged present, and thus future temporal perspectives in which the future is no longer open uh, are part of the picture anyway. So they want to say you've got an invisible thin red line, and I guess there are two different ways of thinking about this. Um, I realise. <laughs> um, so this was one way. Um, actually, these kind of are not part of reality. Only um, things on the red line, only the fragments on the red line um, constitute reality. So that means there are fragments at this node um, which include facts which don't constitute reality. They will overlap with the fragment that does constitute reality, but there are facts at this node which don't constitute reality in some fragments that you can't, you shouldn't think of as, you know, a fragment of reality. Um, so, although you've got a branching order defined on these fragments and these nodes, really the picture looks like this because these guys, right? Of course, there are facts true at these nodes, which constitute reality, but you've bundled them up with a load of facts that don't. Sorry, a load of truths which don't express facts that constitute reality. So it doesn't seem to me like it's a, a, re a genuinely branching picture. Um, okay, so that's, that's my exposition of their view. Uh, so let me say a little bit about relativity. I think I've got a fair bit of time. Have I 10 minutes, 5 minutes? Yeah, we started at 3.07, that's 3.35. Right. Yeah, great. Okay, so... Um, yeah, what I've given you is a uh, kind of simple version of my old view. Um, I've tried to talk you through their view. Um, so what, how do, where do we go when we start worrying about relativity? And of course, from my point of view, considering views like this, that the point was to come up with something that might apply in the context of relativity in a way that standard tense realism, realism doesn't. And of course, Fine himself, introduced, he, he, one of his two main reasons for saying let's consider non-standard realism is that he claimed it was better able to accommodate a tensed metaphysics of time compatible with relativity. And his way of doing it was just to consider um, not only every time and consider the factors of those time as fragments internally coherent but collectively incoherent constituting reality but now the facts are to be read off if you like from a time in a frame so you've just got a big uh, plurality and you know this works it has some funny consequences one of which he kind of highlights it's not clearly whether it's he's highlighting it as a cost but you know it turns out that the space-time structure of the world is Newtonian space-time rather than Minkowski space-time. It's just uh, Newton there are lots of Newtonian space-times all sharing common space-time locations. Um, here's one of the worries I have about doing things in terms of frames. I think this is the main worry, which I'll, I'll say more about in a second, but I think this is important. So often people talk about you know, the frame you're in. This is meaningless, right? 
you might say, I mean, I'm in loads of frames. And if you, know, you and I are moving with respect to each other, of course I don't want to think that you're in a frame that I'm not in and vice versa. Right? Frames are just ways of describing what's going on. And given our motion, given the vagueness involved, even in the context of special relativity, you can't pick out my rest frame. Right? This isn't a well-defined notion. Um, so if I then ask myself, you know, introspect, you know, and think right now, uh, this, you know, wh what is my reality, right? Trying to indexically using reference to myself to pick out a fragment. You know, it's not clear that I should think I'm succeeding in doing that. Um, so um, that's one feature of this view. But, you know, frames might not be as useful as you think they really are in special relativity, but in a space-time where you don't have the symmetries of Minkowski space-time, there's just no notion of a frame that extends and has a preferred simultaneity associated with it. I start at a particular point, I start with a particular timeline direction at that point, and very quickly, depending on how variably curved the space-time is, how I extend that, you know, there's no preferred way of doing it. Um, so frames are just not useful uh, notions in general relativity, at least not in the sense in which they're being used by some metaphysicians in the context of special relativity. So it's good to have a view that doesn't use frames, doesn't relativize things to frames. And we'll see in a moment another kind of perhaps common misconception about how things work when you relativize to frames. So there's a well-developed framework uh, in which you can um, articulate an alternative, namely Belknap and uh, Co's branching space-times framework. And here, uh, so I'm jumping immediately to branching, <laughs> branching, but now the way you think of the branching is that it's branching at um, things that are like events in space-time. Um, these structures are just a bunch of um, events related by, I want to say causal order, but it's um, if E stands in this relation to E2, then um, E2 is a, a kind of possible effect of E. I mean, in some histories it will be, in some it won't be. But anyway, this is how the kind of patching together of histories looks. So think of these squares as representing histories that are um, each individually structured in terms of the causal relations, um, like Minkowski space-time. And we've got these events uh, that are common to um, all four of them. And if we look at, um, in each one, there's, there are only two outcomes of these chancy events. So all history is split at chancy events, right? So all divergence between histories occurs at chancy events, and the divergence occurs along and within the, the future light codons of those events. And if we compare uh, basically these two histories, then we'll see that this area is the thing that's common, and all of this is just different stuff, different events going on in this. If we compare this one and this one, where we get the same outcome here, plus, and a plus here and a minus here, it's actually only this area that's different in this history compared to this one. So the two histories um, match here and here. So you see you've got a bunch of histories um, pasted together in a distinctly kind of relativistic way. Um, so in some ways it's just like our branching time diagram, which was just a bunch of overlapping histories. But now um, we've got uh, a kind of distinctively relativistic um, over pattern of overlap, which shows up in various things being partial orders rather than total orders. Anyway, um, here's some more quotes from our friends um, Iquinto and Tarengo, and they say some things motivating their view. They also attack frame relativizing, but they say some things um, which are just not right. So um, they say, 
two things. One, the temporal relations are local, so we're now talking about the, the geometrical structure of Minkowski spacetime, in that they hold between point-like events rather than hyperplanes, namely times. Okay, I agree with that. It's not clear you should call it local, right? The relata are not spatially extended, but for all we've said, the relations might be very non-local. It's not that they're mediated. Of course, in general relativity, they are mediated. But in special relativity, you can think of, you know, it's just a brute fact that this event and this event is, you know, one meter away from uh, the other one. And here's the key thing, their metrical aspect, right, this nature of the relation between them varies across frames of reference as spatial distances do, right? I think this is the wrong way to think about Minkowski geometry. Um, and they say something similar here. Um, even if it's true that two events are causally connected in a frame, uh, then they are so in every frame. So they're saying causal connectivity is absolute, but the metric distance, the temporal distance between the two events so connected isn't uh, absolute. But it is, right? So here's, you know, Here's the pattern of Minkowski distances. So these pictures are taken from uh, Domenico Giolini's book. Right? So we're considering a particular event here. And this surface is just the surface of events that are, say, one second to the past of that event. And that's a frame-independent metrical fact about the pattern of distances in Minkowski spacetime. Again, think of these as um, you know, the events that are one light second away from the, the center point. So this event, this event, this event, they're all the same distance from that one. And that's just what Minkowski geometry looks like, this, this particular pattern of time and distance relations. So there may be no time in Mark's sense, but the temporal distance relations you have, you can think of as being just like the ones you're familiar with from Galileo and space-time. It's just the pattern of their holding between the points of space-time is, is a different pattern. Okay, so um, given our branching spacetimes picture, given the temporal distance facts between all these events, um, what are the tensed facts that we're going to plug into our non standard realist branching view? Well, there are different ways you could go. So, um, in their um, growing block book, uh, Fabrice and Sven have this. Tense logic for spatiotemporism, where you've got a elsewhere operator. Um, I'm kind of tempted at the idea of just doing it with tense operators alone. Um, and notice some things that you know are true in a classical pre-relativistic context won't be true. So if it's true in n units of time that p and it's true in n units of time that q, it doesn't entail that it's true in n units of time that p and q, right? The p point might be here, the q point might be here. Right, there's no point on which both P and Q, that, that doesn't follow there's going to be a point on which both P and Q are true. Um, and crucially, and this is why we perhaps can do without a space, an elsewhere operator, things like it will be the case that it was the case can be true without it being the case that it was or is now or will be. Right? That's how you characterize, that's, that's going to be a distinctively elsewhere fact. Um, so anyway, you can see that given my branching spacetimes uh, and the branching nature of it, I'm going to be able to, you know, in certain ways, read off a bunch of tensed facts, including might facts and bivalence failures to recognize the openness. By the way, this, I would say, is just the picture, although put in different terms, that Stein put forward when um, responding to Putnam's argument, where things are determined as of a point, but things both in the elsewhere and the future can be indeterminate. But as of that point, you've got that um, ineliminable relativity in the position Stein gives. And here's the invisible thin red line version. Out of all these histories pasted together, we just pick right, one to give us what's true as of a space-time location. And then from our branching model, we'll get the tensed facts that include openness. Um, and you know, as you follow a line through this history, the determinateness will get resolved. Um, so that's the picture. Um, uh, so here is just flagging that this does generalize in natural ways to general relativity. So um, assume I've got something which looks like a branching spacetimes model. 
where the different histories that are pasted together, you know, the overlap will, you know, you've got a given geometry, but compatible with that given Lorentzian geometry, I'm going to have different uh, extensions. So I can have distinct Lorentzian geometries literally overlapping. Um, it's another question how you're going to think of these as all solutions of general relativity. So it may not be generally relativistic in that sense, but it is going to be, you know, different possibilities can have different geometries. I've got the branching space-time structure. I've got my preferred history. How I extract my fundamental tense facts from this um, is perhaps not completely straightforward. It really helped that we had space-time locations to use. But, you know, I think it's clear that there are ways you can go about it. So, you know, suggestion. This picture naturally generalizes. So, let me finish by giving you what Yaquento and Tarengo put forward in its, in, instead. Right, so they have um, their fragments. So, my fragments were collections of tense truths that are true as of a point in space-time. They want to relativize not to a point, but to a causal curve and a point on that causal curve. And the reason they want to do that is that they seem to think you need this causal curve. Um, because they think, for example, that given a point and given an event in its elsewhere, it may be determinate that it's in the elsewhere, but it's kind of frame relative what the spatial distance to the point is. And I'm saying, actually, no, that's a misunderstanding. So part of their reason for going this way is just obliterated. Also, if you're allowing arbitrary causal curves through any point, you know, and also recognizing the full extent of the frame invariant truths that are true relative to this curve and point, then you know, the, the distance between these two um, views isn't going to be much. The, the main distance is that they're going to have as a fact the path-dependent length to some past point. It's not going to be its actual length in Minkowski space-time or the actual distance. It's going to be, you know, the, how far in the past it is will depend on the curve that you're relativizing to. So they say things like this about the twins paradox. Uh, we've got Marta aging more, following an inertial trajectory, Nicole uh, accelerating and um, aging less. And they want to say this about what happens when they meet again. Martha can truly say that the last time they met, i.e. down here, uh, was 16 years ago. Um, Nicole can truly say that the last time they met was four years ago, um, although Martha has lived for 16 years since then. So this doesn't seem right to me, because first of all, when they meet, Martha and Nicole are, you know, in both trajectories, and even if you're relativizing to one of those causal curves and saying what's true relative to it, and relative to that, Martha can say that. Martha is also, you know, facts about her are also true relative to the fragment, relative to this fragment, and she's just as alive relative to that fragment at the future time. And so for her relative to the, that fragment, uh, they met um, only four years ago. Um, so, uh, you can also say that, you know, if you're relativizing to a point, that's the kind of absolute fact. Um, of course, you can't say that when you move to general relativity. So actually, this is perhaps, um, you know, a place where this kind of um, point relative way of doing things breaks down. You've got to... Um, yeah, th there is no distance fact other than... A, a path mediated distant facts between um, points in, in general in a general relativistic world. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? Oh dear. Yes. So it's a basic question about the way you, you treat the, uh, the, the the temporal operators, the future, you know, will yeah. operator. So you said that in your framework. So uh, that you you could have that you know that t plus n p is the case without it being the case that that t it will be the case n days later, let's say. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I assume that, that you have that because you understand you interpret the, the, the wheel operator as, as quantifying all the, all, uh, all the future, possible future uh, uh, branches, right? Yeah, um, that's right. So and, and then the, the one possible objection here uh, is to say, look, I mean, then it's, it's not really a pure double operator that, that you're characterizing. Characterizing the model operator, like it's a possibility operator. So this is not this is not really will. It's it, it's will possibility, like that, right? Uh, so the thought is that you, you and, and given your framework, you, know, you, can, you cannot define purely uh, type of operator because you need to relativize the histories. Uh, yeah. Want to do that, right? Well, uh, so 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 the, the, the objection would be more like okay, you you're, you cannot interpret purely temporal language given these, uh, this way of modeling uh, the language. So I, um, yeah, so, so I mean I think I, I end up here partly by default because I don't like any of the other options, but I'm thinking uh, the way um, the truth of the claim I mean, I don't want to make it linguistic, but let's let's go with it. So, so to determine the fact um, that's um, or whether there is a will fact, right? You ask, you know, that I'm saying here's how to get it. You consider whether the corresponding sentence is true at that context, and you get um, whether it's true at that context by um, asking whether it's true. I mean, the quantification over histories comes at the post-semantic point. So you, the, the semantics is standard Occamist semantics, but then, you know, that's giving you truth relative to uh, moment in history. And then, you know, I say truth at a moment is determined by quantifying over the histories or supervaluating over the history. It's true if it's true in all. Um, it's the negation is. True if it's true and all, um, but if that that means it can, um, yeah, it can come out as neither true nor false. But that, that was not your preferred view, right? No, it, it because, exactly. Because then it changed to, you know, relativizing to science, that is to these, uh, you know, horizontal slices. Yes. I was, I was thinking about this 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 view which, which doesn't invoke history. Right. Correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Good. Uh, so I think the picture is this, that um, so um, my Occamist semantics gives me truth at moment history pairs. And then there's this way of moving to uh, truth at context, where the context of moments are not. And, 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 and if it's on many uh, histories, it's true at a moment if it's true on all histories, moment history pairs the, uh, with that moment if it's first element. That's, that's the rule. And then the red line is just telling you, here are the contexts. That's all. Right? This isn't a context to evaluate truth there. That's, that's how it works. My question. So uh, at one point, I think he said, that some of the possibilities that you might be thinking about with respect to the future of relativistic case are not possibilities with respect to general relativity, but maybe possibilities in some other sense. And so I'm just wondering how how this works. Like, if I'm thinking about the Earth of the future, I'm thinking of like, I guess the physical possibilities, but this would seem to suggest that some of them are not physical possibilities, if they're not sort of like GR possibilities. I'm just sort of maybe you can help me out a bit. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, they're not GR possibilities in the sense that uh, GR is a deterministic theory, uh, despite the whole argument, in the sense that, you know, given, a, uh, given something that looks like this, which is a kind of um, future truncated space-time, um, uh, there's a unique maximal development of that. Um, Cauchy surface um, up to isomorphism. So 
you know, only one of <laughs> only one of these. You know, if we're thinking of these as corresponding to different geometries, um, then uh, only one of them, at most one of them, can be a solution of the Einstein field equations. And if we're thinking of them, I mean, I guess you could have. You know, they could all have the same stress energy tensor, but vary in sub stress energy tense ways, but that's not, not interesting. So the thought was you can have, I mean, it's more the thought that somehow or other we want to make sense of um, different possibilities as having different um, geometries in the way that, um, uh, you know, quantum gravity tells us we need to. So possibilities you can get to from here specified as a Cauchy surface. Yeah, but then you know GR is a deterministic theory, so anything that you know, if, if you're if it's if you're somehow thinking of quantum, you know, the different possibilities allowed by a quantum theory is um, corresponding to the, the different branches, then they're not going to be each branch won't satisfy classical GR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if there's sort of there's some deeper conflict between the sort of the future stuff and the relativistic stuff. Where you're trying to bring them together, but you're trying to bring them together into a deterministic theory. But a lot of the motivation for the open futures seems to be to come from indeterminism. Just not quite sure what's going on, I suppose. Yeah, I mean so so one one place where I think this can um, straightforwardly be applied to um, some relativistic physics, not generally relativistic physics, is um, Lorentz invariant collapse models where you're thinking of the variables as mass density. And then, you know, you can think of this theory as giving you a probability distribution over, um, you know, Minkowski space times painted with different mass density profiles. And they're going to overlap, given that the theory is Lorentz invariant in this um, relativistic pattern, there will be some unexplained, just from the um, mass density thing, of uh, unexplained absence of some histories, if you're, you know, state-involved entanglement. Um, but, you know, it works. Um, so it's only when you couple, you know, it's only where you're allowing how the geometry um, is to be nomologically open. Um, and yeah, I think this is a, I mean, this framework, of course, is, you know, you know toy metaphysics rather than, um, you know, uh, but, but it, it seems to make sense to me. So, certainly the idea of pasting Lorentzian geometries together, where they're, you know, they're non-isometric mm. to, the, to the future. Yeah, no, I think I, can, sense. I think I can make sense of that. I guess it's just not clear I'm making sense of that in the context of general relativity. Yeah. I feel like I'm going into a different right. theory at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's section four. Sorry. Yeah, so maybe you can help me figure out what my question is. Because even I couldn't help but think about collapse. Uh, theories that you know the project is to make them Lorentz invariant, and I recall learning that it's very difficult to move away from a privileged foliation. Say you want to make GRW Lorentz um, you look relativistic, but it can't really be. And here, frame dependence is important. If you have two entangled particles in one um, reference frame, let's say in Minkowski space-time, you measure the particle on the left first, and then it's going to collapse, or it can be spontaneous collapse, doesn't matter, you know, one becomes determinate first, but then in another reference frame, the other does so first, and that poses a problem for narratability, is David Albert's term, and I was just wondering if that presupposes that you can only have one space-time of events as modeled by the red line. And if the model you presented somehow fixes the worry of narratability, 
I know this is very vague because I'm trying to recall what that conversation was, but I'm not sure if you uh, were ever privy to this puzzle. Yeah, so I think the narratability puzzle, uh, I mean, so I, I really can't remember the details, but that seemed to be a very particular uh, worry where, um, you know, from, so, so you might think that uh, there may be no preferred foliation, but, you know, it would be all right if I could reconstruct the history from any foliation, and what Albert shows is that you can set things up so that, you know, relative to certain foliations, something that is visible relative to another is just invisible. Um, now that, uh, yeah, I think that, I can't remember the details now, that always struck me as a kind of slightly contrived case and not, um, not something to worry about in this context. So that's, that's not a very convincing answer. Um, but in terms of the history, so when I was thinking of mass density collapse models, um, yes, the, the red line is a particular distribution. A single history, just, you know, determinate distribution of mass density all over space-time, determinate everywhere. Um, but uh, you then have, that's the, that's the red line, but now if you ask, you know, what are the determinate facts as of some point in space-time, then it will be determinate only in the past light cone, because, you know, there are these collapse changes to the mass density uh, happening and, you know, branching the histories everywhere in the elsewhere. Um, now, what you get, given a certain state, is that um, um, you know, certain correlations between these collapse events in every history, that you can't just get all the possible histories from brute combinatorics. Uh, there are some that aren't going to be there. Um, it's, um, I mean, there's no preferred foliation anywhere here because in any given history, you know, the, um, you know, Collapse centers have determinate space time locations, but there's no fact of the matter about the temporal order. They're just, you know, in the Minkowski distance relations they stand in. Um. So the test facts at what you call moments would truly respect the quantum mechanical probabilities that you get via the Bohr rule, even when you have entanglement, let's say, a space-like separated mm -hmm. systems. And you know, the order in which they collapse will be different depending on your reference frame. But indeterminacy holds relative to M1, M2, et cetera, even though you will ultimately get the red line or the distribution over space time that corresponds to a particular history. Yeah. extends over the whole uh, space time. So if you have a splitting, so you, you should split space time in uh, non numerable uh, infinities of branches. You agree with that? Of, of different space time, yes? But my question is about the differences because uh, if you make the measurement at some point, all the branches should agree on the past causal cone, but uh, where they should differ, because uh, uh, implicitly 
one thinks that there is a moment of the measurement, but this can be any hypersurface in space time. And intuitively also, you, you would think that all the space time of the different branches coincide. Uh, I mean, before this hypersurface, but the hypersurface is completely arbitrary. So this is a, I, I don't know how you choose one hypersurface where the different branches would differ. You understand my question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you don't choose a hypersurface. Sorry. So you don't. So the way the way these models work is that. Um, It's, a, it's another way to formulate the question. Uh, uh, when we say that the measurement occurs simultaneously, simultaneously in all space-time, what means simultaneously? This means you have chosen a frame uh, which corresponds to, to a surface of equal time or something like that. So, um, I mean, there is, so, so no. Uh, that's exactly what you have. I mean, the problem with the so there's I think there's some interesting work to do to really put the branching space times framework, which is an idealization um, from the point of view of um, quantum mechanics and uh, these actual relativistic um, collapse theories say. To, to spell out how this works, but if you look at this branching, right, there is no, um, there is no preferred, um, you know, branching occurs along the future light cones. Now, suppose that, um, you know, we think of these as kind of macroscopic measurements event events that involve collapse, um, and these are, you know, you're an entangled. Um, you know, th these are the outcomes of measuring a, a singlet state, then um, this history and this history are just not going to be in the branching space-time collection because they involve, um, you know, the, the only outcomes you're going to get are going to be anti-correlations. Now, of course, there will be also lots of other histories where, you know, the collapse occurs at different points. Right, but all of these collapses, you know, specialising to histories where something's going on that's going to count as, you know, two measurements made of some spin system in the entangled spin system in the same direction. There's going to be lots of, you know, minus outcomes, lots of plus outcomes, and all of these histories are going to be allowed. Um, but these ones are not going to be allowed. So that's how you preserve the. I mean, that's just ruling out ones that are forbidden, but. Um, you know, the, the theory is going to give you some probability distribution over these histories. Um. I, think, I think we might go to more questions, so we might just move on. So. <coughs> um, thank you. I was um, curious about the sort of failure of harmony or coherence between the, the fragments in what I think you described as the older view. Um, and if I understood that correctly, then on that view, it can be the case that at some time t, it will be the case at time t plus 1 that p, but at the same time at time t plus 1, it's not the case that p. Is that accurate? It's the other way around. So you have the corresponding present tense uh, fact as of a later time. But you don't have the corresponding future tense fact at the uh, as of the earlier time. Okay, so you, you, you will have, have a might fact, fact, but not a will fact. Okay, there, there's no. It will be the case. Yeah. Although at the later fragments. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I so so you know this is from yeah, Quinto and Tarango. They say, you know, it's not many that you have the correlation or the perfect match, but that the present fact constituting reality at this fragment, and this fragment standing in the pseudo-temporal order relation to this one is 
explains, you know, th this future tense fact is true because uh, um, mm -hmm. this later fact is true. And I, you know, I hear the words. I'm not sure I really think they're entitled to say that, given that these facts are just primitively constituting reality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the point I'm interested in is that there is some sense then in which which facts obtain at a certain moment is relative to a moment. So there is a sort of double relativity, right? So that seems to be a fair way of putting the same point. Yeah, so, I mean, um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what I want to say about the, um, so, when I was thinking in external relativist terms, I wanted to say, you know, there are these tense facts that hold as of these times, mm -hmm. and then stop. There's no, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about, of course I say that, but that itself is not a fact that holds as of the time. Tarango and Uquinto want to say they're, they're also not facts, but they want to say they're metaphysically coherent claims about how facts constitute reality or something like that though they're not further facts. And the fact that one fact explains another fact is itself not a fact. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. So, you know, yeah, yeah I, uh, I mean, I, my views on all this aren't, aren't quite settled. Okay. Um, but it's not clear to me that they've got something that I should be embarrassed not to have. It sounds nice, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I was more interested in the question whether this, we have a sort of double or maybe even triple relativity and how that's being problematic or the whole metaphysical picture, because we, we usually talk as if we can go to a fragment and then we have the facts there. Mm. But that's not, that just ceases to be accurate when, when what the facts are in this fragment is itself uh, not an absolute fact. So you have to jump into a fragment before you can jump into a fragment and then the whole thing becomes a bit confusing. So I was wondering whether you have been thinking about that at all. Yeah, I... Uh but I don't think it does. Um, I mean, it seems too linguistic. Sorry, we're out of time. Sorry, yeah. please join me in thanking all of you. Thank you.